Good evening. We continue through uh, the book of uh, Samuel with David in chapter 17. I'm going to be reading starting in verse 40 through 53. So 17, 40 through 53. Then he took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's bag, in a pouch which he had, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David and the man who bore the shield before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good looking. So the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistine to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the, of all, of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword or spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. So it was. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David, David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone, and he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword and drew it out of his sheath, and killed him, and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. Now the men of Judah, Israel and Judah, rose and shouted, and pursued the Philistines as far as the entrance of the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell along the road to Sha'arim, even as far as Gath and Ekron. Then the children of Israel returned from chasing the Philistines, and they plundered their tents. Please pray with me. Father, we're so grateful for your word. We just pray as we look into your word um, that your spirit would be here with us uh, to apply it to our hearts, uh, that we might see your hand even as David saw your hand in our lives. In Christ's name, amen. Uh, today, what, what I want to look at is, uh, is David's battle plan. All right, we're going to look at David's battle plan. So in, in 1 Samuel 7:14, 7, 17, 4, 4, we read, And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath. So Goliath is referred to the Philistine as the Philistine 28 times in, in chapter 17. The Philistine. So interesting, though, if you notice, there's no mention of a king or a lord leading the Philistines in this battle. Only their champion, the Philistine. Clearly, there's an emphasis of Goliath being a Philistine. Not just any Philistine. He is their champion, their head. The Philistine. So what I want to do is I want to step back a little bit, get us a little context. What's the deal with these Philistines and their relationship to Israel? 
So let's, let's go back. It was a couple weeks ago, I said, as John Clifford, right? He was talking about Ham. We're going to talk about Ham a little bit here. Let's go back because that's where, that's where the Philistines originate from, from Ham. We read in the book of Genesis, in the genealogy of Ham, that the sons of Ham were Cush, Mitzrayim, Put, and Canaan. So Mitzrayim begot Kasalahim, from which came the Philistines. So the Philistines came from the line of Ham, the son of Noah, who exposed their father's nakedness. Later we read that after Joshua led Israel into the promised land, one of the pieces of the land that they failed to possess was the land of the Philistines. Now, we see why they failed it when you get to the book of Judges. It says this in, in Judges 3, 1 through 3. The Lord left the Philistines and the other nations that he might test all of those of Israel who had not known any of the wars in Canaan. So it was the Lord's doing that they didn't take the land because he wanted to test those who hadn't gone to war. The children of Israel, however, did not pass the test. You might say the Philistines exposed the nakedness of Israel. For Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served other gods, including the gods of the Philistines. So the Lord delivered them into the hands of their enemies for 40 years. That's in Judges 13.1. Nevertheless, the Lord remained faithful to his promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He continued to rule over his people by raising up judges to deliver them. But by the end of the book of the Judges, you read this. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That's 21, 5, 25 of Judges. So the children of Israel had become like the nations around them who did not know God. Which led them to wanting a king like those nations. So the Lord said to Samuel, Heed the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. That I should not reign over them. And that was the beginning of Samuel 8, 7. The Lord gave them a king by the name of Saul. There was not a, a more handsome person than he among the children of Israel. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than all the people. So Israel was given a king, the king that they wanted, but it wasn't the king they needed. And we read that there was a fierce war with the Philistines all the days of Saul. So Saul never delivered them from the Philistines. In fact, it grew worse. So if we look back at Genesis, when Israel was blessing his children, he said, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. His descendants should have known that the king they wanted was not the one who would deliver them from their enemies. Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin. David was from the tribe of Judah. However, he did not appear to be a king in the eyes of Israel. He was a youth with a staff in one hand, five smooth stones and his shepherd bag, and a sling in his other hand. Now his opponent, the Philistine, on the other hand, was a great warrior with impressive weapons. He even had a, this guy in front of him with this big shield, a shield bearer protecting him. He looked like a champion, big and bad. Whenever the Philistine came out to taunt Israel, the army of Israel was dismayed and greatly afraid at the sight of him. He was a sight to behold. It, it says that he was six cubits, which is about nine feet tall. That's a big guy. But not only did the Philistine have a big body, but he also had a big head. 
If the, Philistine had a self, if the Philistines had a self-esteem magazine, he would have been featured on the front cover. Lifted up in his pride, he looked down at David with disdain and said, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? He was offended that Israel would send a small boy out to fight such a great man as himself. Then we read that the Philistine cursed God, cursed David by his gods. So the Philistine worshiped more than one god. But their, the god Dagon was the one that's associated more with their relationship with Israel. In one of the earlier battles with Israel, the Philistines captured the Ark of the Covenant. They placed the Ark of the, in their temple next to Dagon, their so-called god. Then in the morning, the image of Dagon fell on his face before the ark. So they set the image back up. Then the next morning, the image fell on its face again. But this time, the head broke off and the arms, the hands broke off. Then the Lord struck them with tumors. So they say, we got to get rid of this thing. And so they, carried it, they, they planned to carry it away to, Bath, to Gath. Now, Gath was Goliath's hometown. They even sent with a trespass offering to the Lord. So the news of these events, they, they couldn't have gone unnoticed by the Philistine. He had to have known what had happened. You see, but it didn't penetrate his heart. He had his gods. This uncircumcised Philistine, as David calls him twice in this chapter, was opposed to the reign of the one true God and his people. So the spirit that was in that prideful Philistine has been around for a long while. It's the same spirit that was in the serpent that tempted Eve in the garden. It's a disobedient spirit that exalts itself and refuses to submit to the revealed will of God. It's a deceptive spirit that appears as an angel of light in order to distort the truth. This spirit is the seed of the serpent, is in the seed of the serpent spoken in Genesis 3.15. Now, if you're in the college group, right, they know all about the seed. We keep going back to the seeds in the garden. Uh, I, I think I have a slide for this one. And this is Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity, notice that, enmity, between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now this is right after the fall, right? And so this is known as the Proto-Evangel, which is the, the first promise in the, of the gospel. Right? The seed of the woman is going to bruise the head of the serpent, right? So the serpent and his seed have been at war with the woman and her seed since the fall and will be until the final judgment. There are two seeds coming out of the garden. And they've, you can trace them through the Bible. The Philistine was a seed, was a seed of the serpent. But he's not the only one. The seed of the serpent was also there when the seed of the woman became flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. Christ told those who sought to kill him, you are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. That's John 8, 44. So the war that began in the garden must be fought in every generation, including our own. Most of you already know this. The armies of Israel also knew that they were in a war. The problem was they were not fighting because they were afraid of the enemy. And indeed, the Philistine was terrifying, right? He, he was a tough adversary. But the intel that we have received from the Apostle Paul is no less terrifying. Listen to what he says. 
For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rules of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. The enemies we wrestle against are even more terrifying. The Philistine was easy to see. The enemies Paul describes fly under the radar. You can't see them. So we need a good battle plan. David had one. Let's take a look at it. Uh, this is, this is uh, beginning in 45. I'm not going to read it. I'm just going to talk about it. The Philistine came to the battle with the weapons of man. David, however, came to the battle in the name of the Lord. So David was just a shepherd, but he was not the first shepherd to fight a formidable foe. God called Moses when he was a shepherd to deliver his people from Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. He told Moses, I will certainly be with you. And then he said this, then, then Mo Moses, Daniel, said this. Then Moses said to God, indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. David did not have to come up with a new battle plan. Moses had already executed it and recorded it for all generations as a memorial. It's a simple plan, one that a child could execute. Here it is. Go in the name of the Lord, for the battle is the Lord's. Simple as that. That was David's plan. And he had already put it into practice as a shepherd. David told Saul, about this plan before he came out. He began with a war story. When a lion or bear would come and take one of the lambs from his flock, I went after it, struck it, and delivered the lamb from his mouth. Now let's stop a minute and ponder that. Now, every once in a while, I'll, I'll look at these videos online, you know, of, of these wildlife videos, like these lions and bears and alligators and those things. They're, those are some ferocious animals. When, when you look at them, right? Now, if you were watching over a flock of sheep and a hungry, not just a ferocious animal, but a hungry ferocious animal, right? Like a lion or a bear. And they came and they grabbed one of your little lambs. Would you go after it by yourself with only a staff? David did. Why? See, the name of the Lord was just not letters on a scroll to David or part of a book, a story. The name of the Lord was a reality. He knew that the Lord, he knew the Lord to be the great I am, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the almighty God, because he had experienced his power. David also knew him to be the good shepherd who cares for his sheep goes after them and delivers them from the mouth of the enemy. David was one of those sheep that he delivered. He told Saul this, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. See, the name of the Lord had been tested by David in battle. He didn't need anything else, as he would later write, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I have everything I need. Let me 
a seat. So unlike the Philistine, though, who was fighting for his own glory, David was not. The Philistine had blasphemed the name of the Lord. And David loved the Lord and was jealous for his name. He was going to battle for the glory of God so that all the earth would know that there is a God in Israel. David knew that if he went, the Lord would glorify himself through a young shepherd with a staff, a few stones, and a sling, so that all the assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword or spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. This was David's battle plan. He received it from Moses, and he passed it down to us. The New Testament begins the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. You can trace the seed of the woman through the names listed in the genealogies recorded in the Bible. The promised seed goes through the name David and ends with the name Jesus, who is called Christ. In the fullness of time, the name of the Lord became flesh in the person with the name Jesus. He did not come in all his glory. Instead, he humbled himself and became a servant even to the point of death. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So the name Jesus is not just letters on the pages of our Bible. The name Jesus is a living reality. The name Jesus was the apostles' battle plan. Peter preached the name of Jesus to those who opposed him, saying, There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we may be saved. He was not afraid. The spirit that came upon him at Pentecost is the same spirit given to you and I as a Christian. Paul writes that the spirit of Christ is not in you, then what? You're none of his. So the same spirit we have. Therefore, don't be afraid to proclaim the name that is above every name to your neighbors. Put the battle plan into practice daily so that when the time of testing comes, and it will come, and the great enemy is blaspheming at your gate, you will not cower in fear because you've tried it, you've tested it, and you know it to be sure. But... You will hasten into the battle. You'll hurry into the battle, not flee from it. So, let's look at the last section here, 48 to 53. So in the previous chapter, David was anointed by Samuel, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon him from that day forward. After the Spirit came upon David, we read that the spirit departed from Saul. From that point on, Saul lived in fear. David, however, showed no signs of fear whatsoever. When the Philistine drew near, David did not wait for him. He hastened and ran toward the enemy. As soon as he came within slingshot range, David took a stone, slung it, and struck the Philistine in the forehead and killed him. The Philistine fell face first to the ground, stone dead, just like his god, Dagon. Then David took the, the Philistine's sword and cut off his head, making it evident to, all, evident to all that were watching that the Philistine was dead. The one who held the children of Israel in the bondage of fear through his sword was destroyed by his own sword. So after the Philistines saw that their head was headless, they fled and in the process tossed all the terms 
of the agreement stipulated by their champion. Let me read, what, let me read for you what he had said before this battle. He, he was mocking Israel because they were, cow, they were cowering in, the, in their tents. And he says, choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. See, David killed their champion, but they refused to serve the God of Israel and his people. Instead of humbling themselves, submit, submitting to the living God and serving his people, the Philistines fled as fast as they could away from them and headed back to their dead gods and the people who were like them. But when the children of Israel saw that the one who had held them in bondage through the fear of death was dead, they came alive. The men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the enemy even to the enemy's gates. Then they returned and plundered their tents. So after this decisive victory, the name David became great in Israel. Not only in his day, but throughout the history of Israel, even to this day. In the New Testament, the name David is used 58 times. But if you look close at these references, you'll notice that nearly all of them are used to point us, not to point us to David himself, but to the name of the son of David, Jesus Christ. David's victory was a temporal victory because David was a man who needed a savior, savior to deliver him from death, just like you and me. His days were numbered on this earth just like ours. The Apostle Peter said on the day of Pentecost, Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. That's Acts 2.29. I think I had a slide, but that don't matter. Peter goes on to say that David was a prophet, and he looked forward to the seed that passed through him coming one day, in the flesh to defeat our enemy. Jesus, the son of David, died, rose from the dead, and then he ascended to heaven. He defeated the enemy for us. In other words, the battle is the Lord's. Then Peter said, repent, and every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, David was not looking to make a name for himself. The name of the Lord was great to David. He went into the, bat into the fight trusting that the battle is the Lord's. You see, that was his battle plan. Question is, is it yours? Is it mine? A lot of times we turn to, we go back to Egypt as they did. We go to other men. We go everywhere but to the one who can truly help us. From David we learn you don't need to be the best. You don't need to be the brightest. You don't need to be the biggest. You just need the one who rules over all, but also the one who is here with you, present, and he cares for you. That's all you need. You don't need to fear what people can do to you. You don't need to fear what they say. It doesn't matter. The Lord is bigger than them all. That was David's battle plan. So let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your grace and for your mercy, we thank you for who you are and what you have done for us. We pray, Lord, that we would rest in it. In Christ's name, amen.